Okay, everybody, it's the 19th of December, only six more days till Christmas, holiday season running out. If you still need a gift for the Broadway lover in your life, guess what I'm going to say? Be a BeabroadwayStar.com, best-selling Broadway-themed gift on Amazon.com, and the only Broadway board game there is. Go get it, BeabroadwayStar.com. Now, on with the podcast. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be... Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Podcast. Very excited to have today's guest with us today. Please welcome the President and CEO of the American Theatre Wing, Heather Hitchens. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. So prior to her position at the Wing, which, by the way, for those of you who don't know, the Wing is one of the industry's most powerful and important organizations. Heather was the Executive Director of the New York State Council on the Arts, overseeing the distribution of over 123 million bucks in grants. She was also the president of the National Arts Service Organization to Meet the Composer and CEO of the Delaware Symphony Orchestra. Prior to this research, I didn't even know symphony orchestras had CEOs. So yes, she's a powerhouse of an arts administrator. And I hear she's also a powerhouse of a drummer. Is that true? Are you a percussionist? Well, I don't know if I'm a powerhouse, but it's certainly how I think it is. Tell me a little bit about that. It's both your, as a musician, and as a musician today. Well, I was one of the lucky people that had music in, in the schools as well as arts and school play. And when it came time to start music, they started usually everybody on the violin. And having lived through the Suzuki method with my sister, I was actually a very shy person at that point in my life. Six years old, I said, no, I want to play the drums. And they very, we were very concerned and called my parents and said, are you sure you want to do this? And they said, let her play the drums. And that's how that started. And then I ended up getting my degree in music at DePaul University and in Pennsylvania. And when did you make the decision that you wanted to slide over from being a performer to the other side, the desk, if you will, and work on the administrative side of the arts? It was, it was somewhat gradual. I mean, it was influenced by, you know, my dad was in corporate America. My mom was a teacher who also did a lot of volunteer work. So there was something in me that liked the business side and that wanted to make a difference. And as a musician, when I looked at playing freelance, you know, at that point for percussion, you know, orchestras were the best full time gig you could get, right? right? And the music, you weren't enjoying this time of composition very much more was being written for percussion. So I kind of thought, well, I can either move from gig to gig to gig or I can try and get an orchestra and count for a living. So, so I, and I was kind of interested in the administrative side of things. But I started, after I graduated from college, I worked at a local radio station in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And there was a woman there uh, who did a culture show. I was doing the traffic. I was traffic manager, so, you know, making sure that, you know, super corrupt and A and B weren't next to each other on the wall. But she was chit-chatting with me, you know, in between me doing the log and saying, you know, you, you really should go, you know, to the American Music Theater Festival in downtown Philadelphia. They have internships that are paid more than you're making here. And I did. And that was my first job in the arts, working for Marjorie Samoff um, at the American Music Theater Festival. And they were doing all kinds of interesting cutting edge theater, and it was a great experience. And what was it about the theater that got you even more excited about the career in the arts? Do you remember the first shows you saw on there? We were like, oh, this is, this is cool. I've well, part of this. I remember you know, playing in the pit as a musician and just liking being part of, you know, an art form that brings it all together, right? It brings the visual, it brings the theater, it brings the, you know, music, everything comes together. And so I like that. You you said something about um, wanting to make a difference. What's the difference that you wanted to make back then or even that want to make now? What what, what keeps you coming to to the office every morning? Well, I think initially it was just how important the arts were to my life from the beginning of my life, and seeing over time how that had become more and more of a fight. So wanting every kid to have that experience. And then, you know, I really had the great privilege of working with artists directly over the years and being with those, you know, creative artists, playwrights, composers, choreographers, especially working for my 11 years and being a composer, and I, I realized, you know, the risk that we're taking and, you know, how hard it is to do what they do and how rewarding it is for us to receive what they do. And I wanted to be part of making that happen. So tell me about the, the win. What, in a nutshell, what I always say to people, like, imagine you're in a bar in Omaha, Nebraska. You're sitting there and some guy closes up next to you and says, hey, Heather, what do you 
what do you do? What do you say to that guy who may have never seen a Broadway show, never been to a play? What do you tell him? Well, the women's work is really focused in two areas. One is finding and rewarding excellence where it is, where it lives. So it lives on Broadway, it lives off Broadway, and it lives in the region. So we reward excellence through the Tony Awards, the Obie Awards, and our National Theatre Company grants, which go to emerging companies all over the country that are the cutting edge, that are the R&D of the theatre world. So that's one area. And the other big area that we work on is ensuring we have the next generation on the stage, behind the scenes, and in the audience. And that would be all of our professional training programs, from the Jonathan, Jonathan Larson um, grants to the theater intern network to the Springboard um, program that they develop at our launching factory in Of all those programs, which one is your favorite? Wow, that's hard. that's not a hard one. I mean, I think my new favorite is the Andrew Lloyd Webber Initiative, which is really filling a gap of identifying talent because of the lack of arts in the schools and the lack of opportunities. Really helping schools have resources and then identifying young talent that couldn't afford to go to college or, or couldn't afford to do summer study and identifying that young talent and providing some of the resources. Um, so that's that's the one I'm most excited about as an upcoming project because it's such a need and we're really going to be able to make a difference in the lives of these young people, but it's also really important in terms of the pipeline, you know, for our industry. Yeah, I think that's, you know, one of the challenges as a commercial theater producer I face is I, you know, I tend to think show by show by show. It's very hard for me to think 20 years in the future, even though I should be. Right, because I should be thinking about if I'm going to have a show to produce in 20 years, I need to think about that author who's now eight years old, right. and that's primarily what a lot of these programs do. Absolutely, and you know, and I think when you think about the future and you even think about the present, you want to make sure that the theater reflects the world that we're living in, and that's one of the major sort of you know goals of the Andrew Weber Initiative and some of our other initiatives is really to make sure that we have that diversity on the stage behind the scenes in the universe. So if you could get all of us commercial theater producers in a room, which you actually could if you wanted to. <laughs> and sometimes we do. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you could make a few phone calls and that would happen. So what, what would be one thing you would say to them that we could do as an industry, to try to make sure that the arts were best served 20, 30 years from now. If there was one thing I could do today, what would it be? Well, I mean, you know, in, in talking to you, you, you do it. I mean, it's taking those risks, not only on material that seems challenging, but it's important, you know, to, to get out there because theater is such an important message, right? It's how you gather the people. Take risks on talent and to be really cognizant of you know, all the writers that are out there, whether, you know, to make sure that we, you know, do better in terms of diversity, in terms of women writers, to really, you know, make sure that we look at that so that when we, we look at it 20 years, we, we're hearing from all the voices that represent who we are. You mentioned diversity, and so, um, this is a subject near and dear to my heart, of course, and, and I've talked to a lot of people about it. You know, last year, we had an incredible diverse season on Broadway, but from your perspective, really, how are we doing? Like, are, are we doing, you know, especially compared to the Oscars last year, everyone, all the press, anyone was saying, look at Broadway, it's so amazing compared to anywhere else. Do you think we're doing A plus, A minus? Where do you think we are? Well, I don't want to grade it because, you know, my A plus is somebody else's after grade, you know. But I think, look, last year was tremendously exciting. And it was also an amazing confluence. And we were somewhat lucky that it all happened at once. It doesn't happen that way every season. And what I would say is that's the result of a lot of hard work because we wouldn't have gotten there if people weren't conscious of it. So I think there is a greater level of consciousness of it, of diversity and the importance of diversity. And I don't want to say importance like take your medicine. It's what made last season so strong. It's what made it so vital. It's what made it so exciting. And I think that, you know, it's like now we are, it's, it's the moment to double down, though, to say, look what, look what happened. Look how exciting it was, and it was not only exciting from all the you know ways it could have been, but it was also a, a financially successful year. It was the best tones we've had, you know, in terms of ratings in 15 years. 
So to say, okay, let's like let's look at our own houses. Let's look. Do we have a diverse staff? Do we have a diverse board? Are we producing diverse content? Are we making sure all voices are heard? And I think right now, in particular, this is more important than ever. We give a lot of money away in grants here at the wing, and then we give a lot of money away for uh, New York State. What does someone have to do out there in in the regions to try to get those grants? From like, what what is appealing? The state organizations to the wing, what kind of work, uh, what can they do to be attracted to? Well, I think do good work, manage your finances as well, because it's hard to give, it's, it's hard to, first of all, the work has to be really good, and the finance, you have to manage your finance as well, otherwise we can't give you money, right? That doesn't mean you have to have a lot of money, you can manage a lot, a little bit of money, but just, you know, do that well, and, you know, take risks, be in there. Um, and it, with the, it depends on what program you're looking at. I mean, at the state, there's a whole different kind of thing. And, you know, it was really looking at how these organizations serve the entire state. Because we have New York City, which is a cultural mecca. But it was amazing how in the state and seeing how these cultural organizations formed the center, the town center, and were an economic driver. And so often we're fighting, oh, the arts get cut. But what's so interesting is anytime they want to bring revitalize a town, they bring the arts in because we know that culture works. And now what we have to we have to take the next step is like and figure out once artists help revitalize a town, we have to make it feasible for them to stay there. So that was a very different strategy. That was about strengthening the state through the arts. But a lot of a lot of the same things apply here. I mean, what we're trying to do, I mean, what what makes the American Theater Wing unique is under one tent we have commercial theater. You know, from the commercial theater to the most solid club. And we say, this is one big theater ecology. And guess what? It's interdependent. And when the small guys are strong, it helps the commercial guys. And when the commercial guys have the success, it helps the small guys. And, you know, the Tony Awards, in my mind, are the biggest art of advocacy tool we have left in America. It's like the place where, you know, seven to ten million people, depending on the year, see, you know, a live performing Arts have a lot of the arts experience, and because they don't experience these things or other places, say, oh, I might want to do that, or I would like, might want to support that. But back to your question, we're looking, you know, at the wing, both in terms of the theater companies, we're looking for theater companies and interesting work that are pushing the envelope in some way, and really contributing to the R&D of the overall theater economy. If we're talking about Jonathan Larson grants, we're looking for that next writer, composer, that is going to change the way we think about musical theater. So it depends on the program. Um, but I think, you know, in those two programs. And with the Andrew Lloyd Webber initiative, we're looking for these really talented kids that need a leg up in order to make it so they can make it all the way into our business or, you know, and we can really, you know, make a difference in terms of communities on the stage. Fascinated by your question about they have to have their finances in order, of course, right? And actually, that that wasn't, of course, right to me. I never even really thought of you think about these nonprofits that are doing great work, but of course, if they don't have their for an organization like yourself, and I'm sure that's where a lot of them screw up. Well, some of them do. I mean, look, it's you know, for smaller organizations, you know, you are, you know, it, it is it's it's harder, you know, to do it, but it was it's something that like. I mean, maybe it's because my dad was a business person, so I, I brought both. I was a drummer with this business person father, and it was like I, I bring those two things together. But at the state is where it really became very important because you're asking to invest for people's money. And so the first thing we want to be able to say to them is we're making excellent investments here, you know, and we can talk about, you know, how the arts contribute 135, the nonprofit arts contribute 135 billion to the economy. And we want to be able to say that. We want to be able to say, yes, we make great art, and underneath great art is a good business infrastructure. And even if it's small, it's you know it could be small. You can do good business decisions as a small organization. And in fact, smaller organizations are the most you know in some ways courageous, nimble, and you see it all the time. But yeah, it's really important you know part of you know I, that the art is good and that the, the business is solid. That's really important. What I love about what you just said is that's exactly what I do. Yeah. Like, I'm a commercial theater producer. People think there's such a chasm between nonprofits and, and commercial. And that's what I do. Try to produce great art right. with a great business structure underneath. 
Right. To make profit. And, and you know, and from from where you sit to the smallest not for profit, we're just talking about scale. It's the same thing. And this is actually one of my passions because I think we have too many silos. Well, you know, in this business, commercial versus not for profit versus theater versus you know opera musical theater, and it's like it's all one big ecology. And commercial theater has a really strong role to play. As does, you know, the most of our guards, the most not for profit. And, but the principles underlying it are the same. And, you know, commercial producers, they want to have a hit, but they want it to be good. And look what's, look what's being successful on Broadway. It's so exciting with the quality of work that is also becoming commercially viable. That's, that's great. What do you think about the silo between Broadway and off Broadway? Do you think those should be blended together? Well, I don't know what you mean blended together. I think, I mean, I think, I think they are blended together by the very nature of how the theater works. But blended together as in recognized together in the Tony's mouth, you know, in terms of recognized as the, each one of these sectors or silos or whatever you want to call them plays a critical right a role in the overall health of the theater ecology. Yeah. But I think we have more in common between these two areas than we than there are differences. Like many things in the <laughs> For sure. Is there anything at the state that you ever wanted to do, or even here at the Wayne, a dream project that you want to do that you haven't been able to do yet? You want to throw it out into the universe and maybe it'll happen? <laughs> I'll still think about that. I've usually been able to figure out how to, how to get things done. I think as you get older, you realize you have to go on and that, you know, in my younger years, I wanted to have another thing yesterday. And I still have that impatience, but I think now you can see how you're putting building blocks in place and, and it takes time or things happen to support you. I mean, for example, from the day I got to the wing, I really wanted to find a way to address this pipeline issue of, you know, young talent getting the leg up. And so we had been talking about it for a number of years, and it was just at the right moment that Andrew Lloyd never was thinking about this. So it's it's those kinds of things that create that beautiful moment where we can think and plan about this. So I'm feeling pretty satisfied with that at the moment. Yeah, it's a good point. I will tell you. <laughs> Whenever I'm at an ad meeting for shows nowadays, one of the things some producer usually bangs their hands on the table is, "We got to get more young people to the theater. We got to get more young people in the audiences." Anything that you think we can do more of as an industry on a day-to-day -day basis to get more young folks here? Well, one of the great things I think the industry does is when they have ticket, they have ticket tickets available, they make sure to get it to organizations like us that get it to students so that they can see it. And I think that's really important. But I think the main thing that the industry can do is to support exit because if they don't have it in school and, you know, the amount of Four percent, I think it is, of elementary schools that have theater education in the nation. Twenty-five percent of secondary schools, and that's mostly in rockier areas. There's a real quality issue. So you know they're not getting exposed to it in schools. Those kids whose parents were exposed to it and have resources are exposing them to it. But we've got to find ways to get them young because it's a habit. And if you don't know that it's you know something great. If it's never been introduced to you or if it's intimidating. So I think it's really supported as our education efforts to, to expose them to it and getting them in the theater for, for, for the first time. I'm a huge believer because I know I've never met somebody so far that we haven't gotten in the theater that doesn't want to go back. You obviously work with a lot of great Broadway producers on a day to day basis. Who do you think? Oh, oh, no. No. Just kidding, just kidding. But in all seriousness, well, as, as you look at all well, you ask me who my piece favorites, and I can just end my career later <laughs> on the podcast. I will, I will ask I after have, I press pause. I have no, I, I, they're all my favorites. Of course. <laughs> so without with naming names, but what are the characteristics of the great producers that you see working today? What are the ones that you're like, yeah, that, I, I love that producer. What, what makes a great producer today? Well, it's it's not much different than we were just talking about. Is you have to have the financial infrastructure under it, and then you have to seek out something special and different, and take a fun, and take an artistic risk, and so or do something different. You know what I mean? And so I think those those are the most successful producers. I mean, first of all, it has to be said the risk is taken, 
and the amount of work that's taken to put a show on Broadway is unbelievable. And I bow down to the producers and, you know, just the all that you have to go through to make sure a show comes in. And it might be a beautiful show. And and it, for whatever reason, at that moment, doesn't land with audiences or, you know. And, and we've seen that in, a recent, in recent revivals where the first revival didn't work, but the second revival really worked. So it's, you know, it's a tenacity. It's a deep belief in, you know, what they're producing and the content. You know, it's like having the courage of their convictions about the content, having a point of view. You know, really being passionate about what they're putting on the stage, and then obviously having the financial and infrastructure and the income. Obviously, one of the big, the wings, biggest endeavors of the year is the Tony Awards, of course. And uh, we talked a little bit about last year as it being so very successful. What what do you think makes a great show for the people, and how it's so important, obviously, because it, it does advertise our uh, the theater in general. What do you think makes a great telecast? What do you think the audience want to see? Well, I think it's a combination of, you know, showing the season. And, you know, I think it's it's really hard to do, right, to find the right moment in the show. And I think we really do that really well. And then it's like a host that people want to see doing, you know, fantastic special material that really excites them and looks entertaining. I mean, you know, it's interesting because, and, you know, the Broadway League is our great partners in this, and Charlotte and I often talk about the fact that, our particular challenge is that the Tonys are the beginning of a conversation with the national audience, where the Grammys and the Oscars are the end of the conversation, because the albums are out, the movies are out, everybody's familiar with our content. So this is the time where we introduce ourselves to the national audience and say, this is what's on Broadway, and you know maybe you want to see a show. So it's it's both a challenge, but it's also very exciting. And unlike now the great advantage that we have over, I think, the other shows is we have this amazing talent. Nobody has talent like Broadway. This is it. This is where everybody comes to. And whether it's music talent, you know, you've seen major music talent come through Broadway, particularly recently, who want to write shows that have never written shows before. It's where, you know, the movie and film people, they want to be on Broadway. They do the movie and film stuff, but they want to be on Broadway. And we even had Mike Tyson on Broadway. It is, it is really where the stars align, and that's what makes Broadway exciting, is that we're the one place that brings all of this together. Any advice for producers out there that debate over and over ad nauseum about what number they should do on the Tony Awards? This is like, you know, as a group, we all scream, you know, this number, this number, what do you think comes off the best? What advice would you give? Well, it, it just depends on the show. You know, the sad part of, the, of my job is that I sit in shows and go, ooh, that's, that's the number. And that's the number. But then, you know, I, I think this is where Ricky and Glenn, like Sherry, are so talented because they really help look at a show. And I'm not going to say this show, but when I heard that was the number, I thought to myself, oh, okay. And they were absolutely right that that was the number, you know, and it was incredibly successful. And it's, it, you know, it's a stressful thing, but I think they're also looking at the number in the show and how it works against the other number. It's really interesting I would stress out too. I find myself, as I say, in the show going, is it this number? Oh, wait, maybe it's that number. <laughs> and I'm kind of glad I don't have to make that decision. But I certainly have opinions on this, as we all do. Is the ring involved in global Broadway efforts and spreading the word about the theater and Broadway all over the world? Well, you know, through our Working in the Theater documentary series, which is available online, we have a decent sized international audience. And I think, frankly, we live in a global world. And theater is growing all over the world. And, you know, we move, you know, between, particularly between London and here, but also China and other places. And so I think just by the sheer nature that we're involved in the commercial theater business means that we're part of the global commercial theater business. What do you think Broadway looks like in 20 years? Well, you know, I hope we're, the best thing is that we tell these stories and we tell the diversity of stories that we tell. And I hope it just looks like an evolution. I hope it looks like an evolution. <laughs> That's what that okay, my last question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to pay a visit here at the American Theater Wing, knocks on your door, and wants to thank you for all the grants you've given to organizations all over the country and all the work you've done throughout your career. I want to thank you by granting one thing. What's the one thing that 
makes you the most angry about Broadway in general? What gets you frustrated? You know, what makes you bang the desk, slam the phone down, slap the laptop closed? Makes you want to give it all up. You would ask this genie to wish away. Wow. <laughs> I know there are lots of things, probably. You know, what frustrates me, because I've been working many years in the arts and fighting for resources for the arts, whether that be as a tax break like the Broadway that just achieved, or whether that is funding for the arts and arts education, and very few artists who make it have ended up supporting the arts as their charity. And that's what's so phenomenal about what Andrew would like. And, you know, Alec Baldwin has also been out there, and, and, and there are people that have done that, but that... A big challenge of our business is the audience, is the next generation. What does the stage look like? You know, do we have an audience? We want younger people. And so I guess what I would, it doesn't make me angry, but it makes me anxious that, you know, when, as people make it in this field to remember to put the money back into arts education, because that's really, it's a good thing to do. It saves lives, but it's also, you know, good business for the industry. Don't forget where you came from, everybody. Thank you so much for that answer for this podcast. Thanks to all of you for listening in. We'll see you next time. Last chance to get the Broadway board game Be a Broadway Star in time for Christmas. Go to BeABroadwayStar.com and pick yours up today.